Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the channel. Uh, today, I'm very pleased to have Mode and um, Hong Chao. Uh, they're from Alephium. Uh, Hong Chao is the core developer of Alephium, working very hard on uh, one of their upcoming upgrades called Lehman or Lemon. And Mode is pretty much uh, has their hands in everything non uh, development related. So, welcome, guys. Thank you for joining. Hi. Thank you very much for, for having us. Yeah, yeah, thanks it's a lot good. for having us. It's good to see you um, again, and it's nice to meet you, Hong Chao. Um, so, um, the Le Mans upgrade um, is a very significant event and milestone in Alephium's development. It's been on testnet for quite a while, and now you guys are ready to finally have a mainnet uh, public uh, launch. So what is the significance of that upgrade and what could it really do to influence uh, Alephium's relevancy in the industry? Um, I give I give a high level and maybe Hong Shao, then you can dive a little bit more into kind of the every, the technical capabilities that the Lemo upgrade will, will unleash. So the Lemo upgrade uh, is the result of almost a year worth of work that the team has been doing into really, it, it's basically... Uh, make it's basically the upgrade that is going to make it easy for people to build on Alephium. So a lot of functionalities have been added, a lot of improvements into the virtual machine um, and the SDK and a number of other parts around the ecosystem of Alephium have been uh, have been included into this upgrade. It's also maybe um, significantly, this is also the upgrade that will allow us to release the first bridge on the Alephium blockchain. Uh, so the bridge to the, to it's a wormhole based bridge to the Ethereum uh, blockchain at first. Uh, maybe Yong Xiao, you can touch a little bit on kind of the technical capabilities brought in by the Lemo upgrade. Yeah, of course. Um, the Lemo upgrade, uh, basically, as, as Mal said, um, they introduced a, introduced a lot of uh, interesting like features, functionalities. Uh, into the blockchain, also it, it also improves the security of the, of the blockchain as well. And when it comes to like uh, functionality, we introduce a lot of uh, interesting like things such as like subcontracts concepts, and that's essentially like a map the data structure, but uh, more more secure. So that enables us to do um, yeah more interesting things with the smart contract. We also have introduced uh, dynamic array indexing and also like building functions to do debugging and logging and so on. Um, so yeah, uh, this is uh, many of these kind of stuff are discovered while we're just uh, developing the, the, the bridge. And we, we feel that, okay, yeah, having this uh, functionality in the language and in the VM uh, definitely yeah. help us to, to do things in a more efficient and secure way. That's why we sort of introduce some of those features. And for when it comes to security, we um, also realized that um, for example, like there is a feature called uh, external call checks system, and it's because when we do, while we're developing the bridge, we feel like um, in a lot of cases, like the functions, uh, we we have to check, for example, where the call is coming from, and in the end, we have like this kind of, this type of checks like all of the place, and then we realize that maybe it makes sense to actually introduce like a formal system in the language. To actually make the whole make it make this as a default, so that all the smart contracts can benefit from from this type of security features. So we actually introduced um, the external contract system, and we also have like for example assets permission system, where basically whenever so you know exactly where what um, token and how much of the token can be actually spent by a smart contract, which is in smart contract to for example Ethereum. So we feel that these type of features allow us to actually develop smart contracts in a much more secure way. And also like, for example, um, we also introduce, for example, like mutable like fields and immutable fields. We sort of distinguish those two things. And then at a VM level, we actually store, uh, for example, the mutable state of the contract and the immutable state of the contract in a separate, in a separate place. And that basically at a VM level uh, help us to make the uh, system much more secure as well, like things like this. So basically, uh, to summarize, uh, there's like a lot of features and uh, those things when it comes to like making developing smart, uh, smart contracts more secure uh, and more efficient. Um, yeah, like 
uh, basically just makes stuff a little bit uh, more, much more easier. We introduce a lot of this type of stuff in the in the new level upgrade and developing bridge and also like other uh, smart contracts such as like DEX and uh, NFTs and so on. It's almost like a driving force to, uh, for us to actually make all those changes. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, it kind of feels that uh, usually when people are the end users and they're not necessarily uh, too much into the nitty gritty of the development tools, you know, the updated SDKs and, and all of the tools that you're providing in the upgrade, the first thing they think about, okay, we got a bridge, we got a DEX, we got NFTs, they gravitate towards the things that they're uh, most comfortable with. Um, usually first introduced on Ethereum in the past few years that uh, those end users really get excited for, and then they can help to drive activity on the chain, uh, trading volumes go up, and then liquidity as a result of the bridges and DEX also go up and drive up uh, demand for the coin. And, um, and obviously for miners, and in a proof of work setting yeah that's that's very cool yep yeah exactly like it really this this upgrade will, will really mark the the point where building on alafium will become extremely convenient easy and also very interesting because of all of the built-in security features that have been put uh, that have been implemented in the virtual machine and in the in the smart contract languages uh, this is going to, we're really excited to have developers to start really building and being able to experience uh, a lot of the innovation and a lot of the work that has been put into LFM. Yeah, uh, probably I want to add another thing uh, is that the, uh, we have also improved a lot when it comes to like node APIs and, um, and SDK. And so we have like uh, developed good abstractions for uh, signers, uh, which is like something that can implement uh, different kinds of uh, wallets to basically sign different types of transactions or sign messages and so on. So uh, dApps can actually use this uh, abstraction to interact with wallets disregard of the actual wallet implementation. So uh, we have just released like extension wallets and we also will have uh, like mobile wallets and we have desktop wallets and dApps can actually interact with all these uh, like different wallets in a pretty seamless way because of uh, this type of uh, structure that we have implemented in the in the SDK, and also when it comes to like software development, like regular software development things, such as like just coding and do like testing, integration tests, unit tests, and then like just deploying the smart contracts to different different network and so on. Um, I think we have done a pretty good job to make that a pretty smooth uh, experience. Um, yeah, we yeah. For example, we 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 generate we do code generations for, from from the smart contracts to type scripts, and then you, you don't have to even like uh, like import JSON file or something. Just like interact with the smart contracts as if you are actually interacting with a just like a regular like object or something. And then um, yeah, hopefully developers will be able to see that and feel like if they try it out, they'll they'll see the uh, the amount of thoughts that we have put into this. Yeah, and then it's just a snowball effect, like you mentioned. It starts from developers uh, enjoying the the experience and the capabilities that Alephium and its innovation unleash, and being able to build uh, exciting exciting application that people then get excited about. And then this is a a snowball effect that hopefully, um, you know, will bring shed lights on the great work we've been doing at Alephium. You've mentioned uh, the virtual machine and the programming language. Uh, you have a VM called Alfred and the programming language named Ralph. Um, and that's obviously kind of a bold decision for any new blockchain to kind of come out and do their own uh, VM and programming language. Um, why was that decision made to begin with? If we backtrack a bit from the Lamont upgrade from the beginning, why is uh, your own VM and programming language important for you guys to have kind of natively and, and for your own blockchain? And what are the benefits of having both of those tools um, integrated together? Yeah, maybe uh, like we did before, I, I'll go really high level and then Hongshao can dive a little bit more into the details. But the, so the first thing is uh, we use our own um, UTXO model. So first of all, we're UTXO based. So because of that, we just can't use, we're not account based. Being UTXO based, we can't use EVM as it is, for example, because it doesn't work with uh, 
the UTXO model, right? And even more than that, we have our own UTXO model, which is called the stateful UTXO model, which combines uh, some of the logic of UTXO, but also some um, principle and logic brought from the account model. Uh, we treat token and smart contract state uh, differently into our model. So we have our own um Say fully takes a model. So we can't really use any existing virtual machine out there because it's not made to interact with the technology that we have. Uh, and also building our own virtual machine in our own smart contract languages allowed Hong Xiao and of course the rest of the core dev to also build it in a way that they felt could address not fully address, but mitigate or at least offer a safer alternative to, to the way uh, smart contracts are built and decentralized application are built uh, on EVM. There, you know, I think Hong Xiao, we can touch base on the more precise aspect, for example, that we have tried to mitigate with Alfred and Half. Yeah, I just add that, like, uh, the reason that we picked UTXO, not completely a complex model, it's because number one, UTXO is like a very proven technology and uh, it's been securing like uh, the biggest uh, blockchain, like Bitcoin, uh, hundreds of billions of dollars uh, for a very long time. So it's like the most proven technology. And number two, um, it turns out that UTX model is, it's very good at uh, concurrency. Like uh, it's, it's like you can execute this UTX model like in a parallel. And that's kind of crucial when it comes to like um, implementing the sharding algorithm that we that we have. So um, basically we're using UTX model to manage and secure the assets. And then we're using like uh, the stateful parts of the UTX, S, S, uh, UTX uh, model to, to manage the state of the contract. So that's basically why we use the S UTX model. Um, and then uh, just as uh, Mao said, um, because we have picked this model and all, with all the benefits that comes with this model, uh, we can't really have uh, our own. Uh, we, we can't reuse really like other virtual machine. We have to develop our own uh, virtual machine. And in order to leverage all the security benefits and all the like uh, uh, the, the benefit of the, this this VM, we we have to come up with our own language to do that. That's why we have like our own VM and our own uh, language. And when it comes to uh, just give you like um, one sort of benefits that this enables us to, us to do. The the assets provision system that we uh, have mentioned before when we, when we talk about uh, the map bridge, um, that wouldn't be uh, possible with the convex model because we we need to know like precisely like what is uh, 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 needed by smart contracts and then we need we 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 because of the UTX model we are able to actually know like pick precisely like what kind of inputs that we need to actually go into the smart country. So like there are things that uh, we can only do using this model. So if we picked a, like a random, like a, just another VM or something, they wouldn't be able to know like all these things, all this information about the, where the assets is and, and so on. So um, yeah, that's just one example that, uh, yeah. And, and for example, um... On the left hand, flash, flash loan is not available by design. So there has also building our own virtual machine and having our own smart contract languages also allowed us to, to have built in features and by design, um, making the design choice that will impact the developer experience in, in our opinion, uh, positively. Obviously, you know, in tech, there's always trade off to make and some people pre prefer some and others. Um, but it has really, if you want to summarize on a high level, the idea was really to make it easy to build secure smart contract on Alephium because um, even with e EVM really paved the way, but today um, this is why you see so many audit company offering, offering to audit your contract security is because building a se secure smart contract is not trivial and even experienced developer there are still vulnerable vulnerabilities and we see a lot of smart contract hacks happening. And so what we try, uh, I'm not saying that Alephium is secure against every hack or things like this, but what we try to achieve with our virtual machine and our, and our smart contract languages is to make it easier to build a secure smart contract by eliminating some of the common pitfall and addressing some of the common issue. And by addressing, I don't mean solving completely, but at least mitigating some part of it. 
Right. Um, yeah, that would be definitely thinking about the long term perspective. You want to have a solid foundation to begin with. But um, going back kind of to the beginning, you mentioned um, for the bridge wormhole. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but wormhole also has a notorious reputation for the exploits. Um um, that it, it occurred with other chains. Um, what do you guys, uh, knowing the past uh, kind of notorious uh, hacks in the crypto news and, you know, a lot of value being stolen by hackers and things like that, learning and, and taking from the experiences of the mistakes made there, how does the Lefium kind of incorporate the past, um, as you said, pitfalls into making sure that you protect against them as much as humanly possible going forward when bridging into Ethereum. Um, what what I will say just about the choice of going for a wormhole. Wormhole is today in terms of bridge one of the bridge that has been the most used. It means it's also the bridge that has gone through um, the most uh, testing because it has been the most used and. and uh, most of the exploit that we've seen around wormhole bridge weren't from the, let's say, generic wormhole, wormhole part. It was a lot on the smart contract that was built by the, on the smart contract side that were specific to the project using wormhole rather than wormhole itself. Um, so that that's kind of why we still feel like wormhole was a good choice. Obviously, there are some things to watch out for. And, and Hong Shai has spent a lot of time working on, on that bridge so he can give a little bit more insight into what we looked into, what we've changed and things like this. But it, it is one of the bridge that has seen the most use and has been the most tested in multiple scenarios. So the vulnerability are known because of that because it had so much usage. So then it makes it easier to at least address those known vulnerabilities. Um, Hong Xiao, maybe if you want to speak a little bit to the bridge and what we've done on our side. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, I, I think um, um, just as Mark, Mark said, uh, the bridge itself, like the bridge has different parts. Uh, one is the, like the core part of the bridge um, where you have like um, Verifiers in 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 the in the wormhole uh, terminologies like guardians, like who is in charge of basically signing messages and so on. Like and there's like a, a logic to actually relay uh, messages and it's like a lot of moving parts. And another very important part of the bridge is like the smart contract that's um, run on each of the chain that does actually the verification of the messages and sending of the messages and so on. Um, so for all the known attacks that happened to wormhole, um, it was either like the smart contract on a particular chain, or like from uh, like in the case of the Solana, uh, they basically didn't upgrade the the wormhole uh, version or something, if I remember correctly. So um, the wormhole, like the when it comes to the wormhole, like specific code that we we have uh, spent quite some time to investigate and uh, and so on and. Um, we think that it's it's probably one of the highest quality uh, bridge, like when it comes to crew qualities and so on, in the market. So that's pro that's one of the reasons why we picked it. And there are like several layers when it comes to like a security of the bridge, and security, as we all know, is a very complicated topic. Uh, so that's the bridge itself. And then we basically took the bridge and we did some modifications to it, and also we had to implement our smart contracts on top of it. And that's where basically a lot of the security uh, aspects of the language and VM comes to place. And also, like we realized that our language is actually quite, it's very it's very precise, uh, like concise as well. So uh, we implement basically the same functionality as uh, in Alpin, in the wormhole bridge, as uh, for example Ethereum and so on and so on. And um, the amount of code that we have to write is like basically orders of magnitudes uh, smaller. So that's very good for security because the less amount of code that you have, the more secure it can be. <laughs> yeah, the less and, likely you are of introducing a bug or something. Exactly, and that's what we need to maintain. And then, um, we, as we discussed, we have like asset management system, the call, like uh, some call check system and so on, to make sure that we um, 
uh, will not uh, have uh, yeah we the, the, the basically make the compiler to help us to make the code a little bit secure. But as Amal said, we no amount of, no amount of security features can replace like a good software engineering. You still can make mistakes. You, you have to like we review like every line of code and we write a lot of tests for that. But um, I think we are pretty confident about our smart contract. Uh, of course, you know, like uh, software, uh, yeah, we can just do as much as we could. Uh, we, but um, we've already tried. Uh, so bridge has been developed for, it's, it's big, like the first version, uh, working version of the bridge uh, was done like basically almost uh, more than half a year ago. Like the yeah. amount of like, scru scrutiny like, that we had down to the bridge was like a lot. Uh, and then uh, on top of that, there are other aspects of security, for example, like um, you need to operate the bridge, like the, the modern in infrastructure that you have to like. Let, let, let's say like uh, uh, like for all the bridge hacks that we had witnessed uh, last year, many of them are due to key management. Like we have like four uh, out of seven keys, and then many of them are actually managed by the same entity or something like that. Or like the keys are leaked somehow, and that that's basically not even related to blockchain. Like you, the, the the way that you manage uh, a uh, infrastructure, how to do manage it securely, um, both when it comes to infrastructure, but also like when it comes to like how, like just as an organization, how do you like run this type of stuff? We have putting a lot of thoughts into this as well. For example, our, uh, the, the, the way that we design the, the Guardian, the verifier, we can even, even if we want to, we can't even see the key. So if, if you can't see the key, then there's no way for you to leak it. So there's a lot of, uh, you know, security consideration when it comes to, Bridge that we have uh, considered, yeah. Okay, perfect. And for those watching, um, to be clear, uh, smart contracts are deployed on both sides of the chain. And in the Solana hack with Wormhole, with, um, Wormhole for example, the exploit was found on the Solana side, not the Ethereum side. Um, so, okay. That's a good defense <laughs> because a lot of people that may not know uh, the development side, they read the news and they say, oh, wormhole, oh, you know? So yeah, it's, yeah, it's good to clear it up and, uh, you know, um, put the responsibility on the foreign chain uh, to yeah. make sure that they secure it. Yeah, exactly. And it's also, like, like I mentioned, it's also wormhole has been probably the most used bridge. So it also makes it's also the one where the vulner vulnerability are the most known, uh, and and it's better to have known vulnerability that you can mitigate or address rather than operating with unknown vulnerability that you might find out uh, later on. So that's also uh, it can obviously, like you said, if you're just reading the news, you're thinking wow, uh, but actually knowing what you're working with is much better than not knowing what you're working with and be surprised later on. Yeah, that's a good point. It's like a, a highway that has heavy traffic is more uh, likely to have more car accidents, but then you can put up the safeguards and the rails uh, to protect and, and mitigate and know where the points of fault are versus a road nobody ever uses. And uh, you don't really know how safe that could be long-term when traffic picks up on it. That's a good point. Um, Hong Chao, I have a question, a, a little bit off script. Uh, while we're talking about all of these, you know, features and strong muscles of the lepium um from your point of view um how can a lepium attract the developers um to build on here do software developers naturally gravitate towards better technology um or do they really gravitate towards what could be more lucrative um for the amount of work they have to do versus the amount of uh, fi for example financial payment that they could receive for example why would a developer say Alephium and not um, Ethereum if Ethereum is more, perhaps more lucrative in the short term? Um, I think all of all of the things that you mentioned uh, definitely played a role when it comes to like uh, like attracting developers. Uh, financial incentive is important. The uh, good tech is important. How smooth to get everything up and running is important. Ideology is important as well. Like how decentralized the thing is. Because sometimes you feel good if you are doing things in a decentralized way. Uh, at least for me, that's the, the case. So um, for us, I think uh, we want to um, number one build the like most decentralized uh, uh, blockchain as we can we can do 
basically that's something important to to us something that we believe in and we feel that there are like a group of people who believe in this as well and number two we want to make uh, our development stack like as smooth as possible like to uh like you can write uh uh secure code in the like it also is uh, like not smaller uh, amount of code compared to others to achieve the same functionality and the developer learning experience is uh, uh hopefully like a great uh, as well um and then um with as, at least for me i think uh, i'm not a business guy right but i i think uh, uh we I, I think i believe in the multi-chain world and I think, uh, like, of course, there will be a lot of people developing on Ethereum, and that's fine. And uh, I think we have our unique uh, selling points. And, uh, like, for for example, when it comes to like, uh, I I think we have like some 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 very like actually quite a lots of unique uh, like technical uh, advantages uh, in our blockchain. So I feel that that we could uh, actually. Have a like a some market share of, of, of this future like uh, multi chain world. That's that's what I feel. Yeah. What do you think, Matt? Yeah, I, I follow I follow your thought. I think that in everything, you know, the de the developer community is also very different, and I think it depends on what the developer or the development team is looking for. And obviously, especially at first, people where their priority is on. Uh, adoption and, and, you know, going into an ecosystem where there's already a huge user base. Of course, in the early days of Alephium, that this is probably not the dev we're going to appeal first, uh, we appeal to at first, but there are already a lot of developers within the blockchain community that are looking for um, because, you know, people have different um, technological ideology into things and Hong Shao touched a point on decentralization. I think that um, Every technological choice has a trade-off and we see a lot moving on the, and, and there are trade-offs into choosing proof of stake and the account model. And what we wanted to offer at Alephium is, is a different take on this trade-off is let's see, you know, we feel like we offer an excellent uh, take on, on, on the blockchain trilemma because we have a, a a very scalable blockchain that is very programmable, but that, that still gets benefit from the security and the decentralization of, of the technology of Bitcoin. And I think that this is going to appeal to a certain category of developers. And when those people are going to start building on Alephium and gaining traction and getting users to what they are building on Alephium, this is where eventually also people, uh, also developers where the uh, let's say the access to to a user base might be the primary priority. They might still then they might get into Alephium, uh, and I think that's okay. You know, it's good. You have to start somewhere, and I think, uh, like Hongsha would say, we have very strong selling point uh, to the developers that really are looking for uh, the technology advantages that we have. Yeah, I also want want to add that we. Um... The, 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 like the crypto space uh, evolved really, really fast. Um, for example, the social networks wasn't a thing, like wasn't that much of a thing like uh, one, two years ago, but now it becomes quite of a thing. And, um, uh, and decentralized social network. Just de de decentralized social network. <laughs> like because Facebook has been here for a while, but decentralized yes. social network. Yeah, yes, thanks for uh, <laughs> correcting. Uh, yeah, decentralized uh, social network. Uh, I, I think a lot of the traffic or, or like developer activities were driven by applications as well. And since the landscape has changed like a lot, you look, you never know like what's, what's coming next. And we want to seize the opportunity to uh, like when it like for example, when if we feel decentralized through an error, which is something that we should uh, spend time on and uh, uh, make it easier for developer developer to 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 uh, develop on on top of, then we can spend some time to like uh, make. This this type of application easier. For example, right now in our like extension wallet that we just released, it actually supports the launched protocol, so you can actually sign in to the launched protocol and then and then send messages uh, there. So yeah, there are some stuff that the core team uh, and the, together with the community can do. To yeah, depends on what uh, the direction is, but uh, that's more from like the application perspective. Like, can, can we see the opportunity? Like some. 
uh, like a trend and then bring some five-cap applications into the ecosystem. That's could be another thing. Yeah. And I think really from a then from a more non-development experience related, obviously since since the beginning of since the minute was launched and even before, we've we've always spent time to uh, reward and incentivize people to contribute to the LFM ecosystem, whether it is actually developing on LFM or contributing in any other manner. So we have a reward program, we have a grant program, uh, we are slowly starting uh, doing proper bounties, um, even though we, we are bounties in the sense as proactively putting tasks out there that we want for people to, to take on versus um, rewarding people after the work is done. Um, so we have a number of support uh, support mechanism within the LFM ecosystem to to incentivize people who want to build and help them. We also make sure that the I, I feel like I, we we make a really an effort to have the team very accessible, to have really the the core contributors uh, with the most knowledge, have them accessible to anyone that is starting to build on LFM to help to navigate. Uh, so yeah. And then we're going to con continuously improve this, improve the support system uh, and the incentive for people to build on LFM as well, in addition to giving them a great environment, uh, technologically speaking. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, very quickly, um, wrapping up the questions and discussion about the bridging of, of LFM with other foreign chains, um, Chang mentioned in a recent AMA that there may be and that, no, actually that there are plans to bridge Ergo as well after the Le Mans upgrade is live on mainnet. Um, are there any details you could share with us about those ongoing plans with the rest of the Ergo community? Yeah, well, I mean, there's not, not much uh, beyond a commitment. I don't think there is anything very <laughs> concrete at this stage, uh, because maybe I can clarify a bit. So once we have the Lemon upgrade, we'll go live actually on March 30th, 30th. Is this how you pronounce it in English? Yeah, yeah. March 30th. Um, and once the Lemon upgrade is live, uh, then the bridge will follow shortly after. They are uh, still, the bridge is, remains uh, one of the most vulnerable piece of infrastructure in the blockchain ecosystem. So even after the demo upgrade, we're still going to spend a bit more time testing, fine tuning the bridge. So it will follow shortly after, but not right, not on the same day. Let's put it like this. And once or once the bridge is live, then there is bandwidth, and there are there is a definite uh, definite interest. We we really love Ergo as a project. Uh, every interaction we have with the Ergo community and with the Ergo project uh, team um, is always a pleasure for us. Um, we have already discussed about um, a little bit like what from a technological standpoint and from a development effort, how can we, uh, how what is the process to integrate into the Rosen bridge uh, on, the, on this? And so from the discussion that we have, because the Ergo team has done such a great work on the Rosenbridge side, it shouldn't be. Um, it feels like this is something that uh, would wouldn't be too complicated to take on. So, but again, I'm not a dev, so please don't take my <laughs> don't take my my uh, difficulty assessment as truth. Um, but we had we have discussed about what would be the way to do it, and on the Ergo side. Uh, We've been told that it shouldn't be any problematic because we use the the UTXO model as well. I don't know the 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 bridge to Cardano has been completed and has been is working, right? You're more involved in the Ergo community than than I am. I feel that was a the first bridge was to Cardano, correct? Like, Are you if, referring to Spectrum Finances, the decentralized exchange? Uh, I was thinking like the Rosen Bridge, uh, the first integration of the Rosen Bridge was going to be with uh, between Ergo and Cardano, correct? Or uh, that could be the case. I, I think the um, I think that would be a likely candidate to be first up along with the Lefium. Um, the Rosen Bridge is more of a, you know, overall framework that allows any foreign blockchain to plug into it. Um, obviously, mm -hmm. UTXO model uh, transaction architecture should come first. Um, but as far as uh, like in a, a deliberate official effort that isn't from, um, you know, from a like a community uh, 
team like a spectrum finance doing the decentralized exchange on their own entrepreneurially um i don't know if there's any official announcement on that i'm a little out of touch with the cardano side of things unfortunately i'm trying to get more into that um but uh yeah i don't see why not we actually both use extended utxo so yeah. it's uh it should not be an issue of course when you're dealing with uh, the programming language on the other side and all of these kind of foreign terms to me like haskell and plutus and there's a lot of updating that has to be done on the on the ada cardano side for example with the bridge infrastructure i mean the decentralized exchange um, yeah. So that's on testnet, I believe, on Cardano for Spectrum Finance's uh, decentralized exchange. And uh, I've been told it's a little more difficult, you know, challenging. You have to constantly upgrade to the latest version yeah. of whatever it may be on the Cardano side. Um, but um, I don't I don't anticipate that being uh, too much of an issue if the demand is there. And obviously, Cardano has a top 10 a market capitalization that liquidity would be amazing and obviously sharing it with the lefium would be equally as amazing as well yeah yeah we spoke we we follow closely uh the rose and bridge update on the utxo alliance and and we spoke about it well so on our side there's still a there's still a will uh and a want uh to do this uh once the our wormhole breach is released and operational definitely Perfect. Um, so moving on to your native asset, uh, your coin, ALF, um, you recently had it listed on to Trade Ogre. And obviously, due to recent events in the larger crypto markets, um, and even in the larger financial banking sector, if we're talking about custodians in general, um, exchanges are both centralized and decentralized. And obviously, that plays a huge role in liquidity and market making for uh, native assets on a blockchain. Um, and also gives you wider access to trading pairs, uh, which in turn plays a crucial role on how successful a crypto project can be in the early days, in the early years of development. Um, considering Trade Ogre is kind of a relatively unknown in the for, for most retail users, but it seems to be one of the stronger um, interfaces for doing a decentralized exchange. Um, what do you guys envision the, the future of centralized exchange and decentralized exchange being? And what do you think would be the proper focus for Alephium to adopt going forward? Like, Where should the focus be? So Trade Ogre actually is centralized, unless I am mistaken. So the listing on Trade Ogre was actually a we were we as the core contributor of the project were not really involved we have never spoken to the trade ogre team uh, so that was purely done by the community i think trade ogre is really favored uh, by a lot of miners um, and, and miners really enjoy this this platform mainly because there is no kyc uh, also because it's been around for a while i think for at least five years and it's quite it's been reliable for the users that have used it uh, so we were very happy and pleasantly surprised uh, to see, you know, it shows the dedication and the and the the work that our community is putting, uh, and also that they are doing uh, great work uh, in, you know, spreading the word about why they are enthusiastic about Alephium. Then to go back to your more general question, I feel like on just on Alephium side. Today, to reach the maximum of users, we're we're not going to necessarily favor centralized exchange over DEX or DEX over centralized exchange, we're going to do a little bit of both. Uh, so with the bridge, with the limo upgrade and the bridge that it enables that will allow us to access, you know, for example, uh, to wrap uh, the ALF, ALF coin and have it available, for example, on Uniswap, but it will also allow us to bring liquidity to any DEX that will be uh, built on Alephium. So this is already this. Um, on the centralized exchange listing, maybe we have a slightly different approach than other projects because uh, if you talk to anyone in marketing and crypto, listing into a centralized exchange is kind of the best uh, marketing thing you can do in terms of return uh, on investment. Um, but on our side, this is something that we trade lightly. We don't, uh, we list. Uh, first, because there is a cost associated and, and we want to be mindful about how the funds of the project are being used. What we care about is accessibility. So, for example, in terms of centralized exchange, uh, one of the priority has been to find 
um, a venue for users in the United States, Canada, and jurisdiction that were not uh, supported by Gate.io. Obviously, the listing on Trade Ogre kind of addressed this accessibility issue just because Trade Ogre doesn't have any KYC, so anyone anywhere uh, can use Trade Ogre. But it is still, you know, if you are a less crypto savvy user, Trade Ogre can be a little bit intimidating. Uh, also, so there is still room for having. Um, a few additional centralized exchange listing to make sure that we are available to, uh, you know, accessible to the entirety of our community. So we will do a little bit of both on this. And then, sorry, uh, just to go to the more general question about, you know, DEX, centralized exchange, um, where are we going to? I feel like uh, as an industry, we should make centralized and decentralized exchange safer and more accessible to users. So anything that would help uh, improving accessibility and security and safety for, for users is the direction I hope uh, both part take. Yeah. Cause, cause yeah. yeah. No, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no. Cause, cause decentralized exchange, if you're, again, it's, it's easy uh, to make a mistake to, to, to lose your funds. And so everything that can help protect uh, the user against themselves and against other people trying to abuse, I think this will go a, a great way uh, to increase adoption within the within the space for decentralized exchange versus centralized exchange, but then also more broadly to bring more people into the blockchain space. Right. For Trade Ogre, uh, yeah, you're correct. Uh, I should have said it is not heavily regulated and it doesn't have KYC, um, but it is uh, centralized. Um, yeah, I would agree with that assessment. I think it, although there's been hacks on, uh, there's been great losses on both um, centralized and decentralized exchanges, as we all know. FTX couldn't have raised more money uh, if they tried, you know. It's, it's, it was a huge amount of of a failure, and um, and there's been that on the centralized exchange. I I would assume that uh, on the centralized exchange front, uh, stricter regulations should come into place, which is not very popular to and for the crypto community. But then on this, the decentralized exchange to try to advocate for more open source code, so there could be proper audits and people. Um, can kind of um, pinpoint any any chokeholds or potential attack vectors versus keeping it kind of closed source and nobody really knows the the risk that they're undertaking by using or keeping a wallet active or interacting with the chain and and not knowing that uh you know what's going on on that end. Um, so being based out of Switzerland, um, it's very crypto friendly. I'm told over there. Um, does the ongoing debate here in the U.S. on how to regulate cryptocurrencies overall uh, concern your team at all? Does that not matter? Does it concern you because you want to, as you mentioned before with Trade Ogre, you're concerned at least a bit with uh, U.S. residents also having access to Alpha and, and Alephium as a blockchain? So... I think everyone is always watching very closely, no matter where you're based, um, kind of the movement of the U.S. regulator towards crypto, uh, because um, it, it is always interesting. And I think, you know, a lot of people in the past few years, right, a lot of noise has been around proof of work and proof of and, and mining being banned. And, you know, recently it's actually proof of stake now that is uh from a U.S. perspective that is being discussed as should it be classified as a security or 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 regulated because of that. So we, we do watch we do watch it uh, with interest. It does impact us to some extent in the sense that, uh, you know, whatever we do, we try to take we are based in Switzerland. So the Swiss law and the Swiss regulation is where this is what applies to us the most. But obviously, blockchain and crypto and Web3, this is a, a, a global movement, right? So every regulation, and especially in, in someone with as much risk, with someone with a country with as much risk, rich, sorry, as the US, it has an impact. 
but it's not really concerning on us because it doesn't really impact us directly for now. It might change, uh, but right now, we what we do is that we work very carefully around carefully. Is like we we even in Switzerland that is very crypto and Web three friendly. A lot of things are still not regulated. A lot of things are still in a gray area. And what we do is that we always try to 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 work. We we have good lawyers and to make sure that what we do is in the right side of the gray area and that we we are careful and to think that whatever we build, we build it sustainably, uh, as sustainable as we can when regulation evolve constantly. Um, but yeah, so it's a little bit of a long answer to say yes, but no, basically. <laughs> how, how about for the European Union? Obviously, Switzerland is... Uh traditionally a very neutral country you're not part of the eu um, but that is a little closer to home you're literally surrounded by eu countries does that concern you a bit more but at the same time no for, for the same reasons you described with the us what i would say is being a layer one and so because we are layer one let's say the, the moments in the life of 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 Alephium as a project where regulation has the most impact is either when we are conducting or when we were conducting any pre-sale um, but actually building a layer one blockchain and things like this we're not offering a financial services uh we're not built like this so the regulation that people are watching the most uh and in europe whether it is in europe or also within switzerland it would be more for people who are building uh, financial services on top of a blockchain. This is where there are already a lot of regulation to respect. On our side, we are building a technological infrastructure and where the regulation was the most, uh, had the most impact in what we were doing is when we were conducting the pre-sales. This is where you have to be mindful of how you proceed with this to make sure that you are within the regulatory framework. And one thing, and you know, this is where, yes, the U.S. impacts us. We excluded any U.S. resident or citizen from any pre-sales that we, uh, that we conducted because uh, of the heavy uh, regulatory aspect in the U.S. So in, in that framework, we did pay specific attention to the U.S. But on our day-to-day -day operation, being a layer one, this is not where most of the focus has been right now. Okay, perfect. Um, so when we try as an industry to onboard uh, what they always call the next billion um, people of users in crypto, um, we think about, we usually disregard uh, user experience, um, especially on the development side um, and thinking how uh, kind of uh, newcomers um, would perceive, or be, like as you mentioned with Trade Over Ogre, it could be very intimidating if you're not familiar. Um, obviously, uh, there's still a lack of education around wallet usage, um, what to look out for when you're looking for um, certain exchanges, and and kind of a general lack of education about open source code, and so. Hong Chao, especially, um, developing the infrastructure is one thing, but um, you guys also launched recently a browser extension um, and wallets that can interact with dApps, as we mentioned before. How important is user experience at the end of the day when we're thinking about the end user? Um, so I guess for the browser extension, it, it's um, one of the important audience of browser extension wallets is a developer. So we actually focus a lot on making it a very uh, useful development tool for the developers. But if you're talking about like the regular, like the builders of, of, of the blockchain, I think um, uh, the user experience of the uh, browser extension, we actually, um, um, we, Built on top of a, a, a very very good project called the uh, Arjun Arjun X. I'm not sure whether you heard of it, but uh, they are like pretty uh, good at like designing very good UX for 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 their wallets. And so I think um, the user experience for regular users are pretty good as well. And when it comes to desktop wallets, um, 
we put a lot of emphasis on emphasis on the um, like strike a balance between the the the, the, the feature and the, the ease of use, like uh, into the desktop wallet, and um, I, I feel it's pretty easy to to to, to use. And for like the interaction with the depth and so on, as we discussed before, we have the pretty standard um, abstraction that we have in the web, like in the in the FDK, and that we basically like unify, make, make the interaction with the the wallet pretty consistent. Um, so yeah, I don't know what that's the answer to your question, but yeah. Yeah. Maybe I can add. So if I summarize a bit what Hong Xiao said is user experience for Alephium is crucial at every step. So whether we're talking about developer, because developer are user of the Alephium blockchain, right? If they are building on top of Alephium, they are Alephium's users to some extent. So a lot of effort has been done at every level that people using Alephium at any level also have a great experience. Uh, so we, we spoke very uh, in details about all of the effort we've put on the development experience and making Alephium a very straightforward, uh, technologically in exciting place for people to build on. But uh, Ong Shao mentioned as well, like the our desktop wallet, um, the people who, who built our desktop wallet um, have really made a huge effort on, on accessibility. And I think we've only received extremely positive feedback on how the, our desktop wallet work. Um, and I think this is something that hopefully will get the same feedback on every wallet that we put out there. The mobile wallet uh, should come out soon as well. Uh, probably, uh, I would say probably next month. Um, the mobile wallet and the extension wallet, uh, like Ong Shao said, was with the was built on top of, of what was done by the Argent Argent. Sorry, I'm saying it French. Argent X team, uh, which again is one of the best user experience uh, that you have on extension wallet today. And on top of that, we'll start we'll sprinkle a little bit of our Alephium touch uh, incoming uh, updates of the web extension as well. Uh, so it is critical at every step for us to have a great user experience, whether you're a dev or an end user just trying to uh, store your ALF in your wallet. Great, great. Um, so going back and we're, I would be touching on a little bit more of our previous interview, just to recap a bit about some of the unique value propositions that Lefium has. Uh, when we talk about block flow, and what Cheng worked on there um, to help pioneer that new uh, novel uh, innovation. Um, when we, those terms of uh, DAG and sharding oftentimes are not well understood um, by most uh, of, of retail, I would say. Um, talk to me a little more about the blockchain side of things and the proof of work mining and the innovations that you guys have already implemented from day one um, on mainnet release with block flow and the mining side of things, if you can briefly. Okay, I'll, I, again, I'll go uh, very high level so that non-technical people may get an idea and maybe Hong Xiao, you can give a little bit more technically accurate uh, details. Uh, on the block flow algorithm, this is really the, the algorithm that, that powers the blockchain. And if I want to address, to talk about how block flow works uh, in terms of scalability for Alephium, if I make it very high level, basically what happens, sharding is uh, that we have, this is something that is used a lot in, database as well it's basically parallelization right so we have multiple chain running in parallel which allow us obviously to process more transaction and where block flow and actually using the utxo model makes our sharding implementation first operational and also extremely efficient is that we have single step cross shard transaction so whether you are interacting uh, within a chain or transacting across the different chain of of the lfm network your user experience is the same most other sharding implementation um, that are live uh, today there's not many but usually they have at least two step if not more and usually the the security and the the user experience whether you are within a chain or across chain is very different um and so where you know the technological choices and the innovation of Alephia makes a special is that we have that we preserve the security and have that single step interaction uh to have kind of a homogeneous experience across the network um 
I don't know, Hong Xiao, if there's anything maybe a little bit more technically accurate you want to speak to uh, with regard to block flow. No, I think you, you've done an excellent job. Uh, maybe I can, um, I don't know if I can give a, like, almost like a visual representation of it. Like, for example, if you have uh, like four nodes, um, and then you can, uh, so for, for groups uh, in, in the Alphim uh, term, then you can, you have like 16 uh, uh, blockchain basically, like because every group connects to every group is like four, uh, multiply four is six, uh, 16 blockchain. And then uh, because of the ETS model, like uh, let's say you have the four groups is like A, B, C, D, right? And for B, you would only care about whatever comes into you and whatever comes out of you. And then, of course, uh, to yourself as, as well. So that would be, uh, if, you do, if you do the math, it's like 2G minus 1, it's like uh, 9 chains. So like for B, it only cares about 9 chains. But in total, there are like 16 chains. So it doesn't have to care about all the activities on all the other part of the whole uh, system. That's where we where like the scalability comes from, and if you actually uh, have uh, ten nodes, ten groups, then the amount of chains that we have is like hundred. Then you only have to care about like two uh, multiply ten minus one is like nineteen, which is significantly less than hundred, right? So like that's basically, uh, yeah, how where where the block flow algorithm actually like uh, does the scal scalability. Uh, yeah. Thing. And maybe to, to quantify the, the scalability, so right now on the mainnet, like on Xiao mentioned, we have four groups, which means we have 16 shards or blockchain running in parallel, uh, which take us, um, which would take us up to a little bit more 400 transactions per second. But as the network load increases, and if we see, you know, that it is time, we can increase the number of shards uh, and to 1,024. 1,024, I don't remember, which takes us uh, to, to 1,024 shards. Is that it? Now I'm confused about the number of shards versus number of group. But uh, basically, all of that taking us well over the 10,000 transaction per second, uh, natively on the layer one that is UTXO and proof of work based. So, And again, this limitation of 10,000 transaction per second doesn't really come from a Lefium blockchain, it's more like hardware limitation today. Obviously, as hardware capabilities increases, uh, nothing says that, you know, Alephium cannot have even more uh, groups and then even more shards and then scale above that. And that is without any layer two or any, any other solution on top. And so I think that is a great value proposition to have a decentralized, secure, yet very scalable uh, layer one. And and you you wanted to speak also as well on the on the proof of work kind of mining side. Um, so another innovation that we have is called proof of less work. As you can tell by our naming, we are true artists when it comes to naming our tech. Um, so proof of less work is basically uh, a slight evolution of the original uh, proof of work. What, what changes is that past a certain level of decentralization and past a certain level of hash rate, instead of continuing to increase the cost of mining um, by like externally, we internalize it partially. So past a certain point, miners, in addition to providing computing power, they will be asked to burn some alephium, some alf. And so the cost of mining a new block continues to increase. It's just not 100% paid by computing power. It will be paid uh, at a certain threshold. It starts being paid um, by a combination of computing power, but also uh, by burning ALF. And that's uh, basically, it doesn't eliminate the energy consumption, but it can, it caps it past a certain point. And if you want to quantify this in a way that maybe speaks to people, if, uh, is that if we were, we are ever so lucky to have the same network condition as bitcoins in terms of size, utilization, transaction, we, uh, the proof of less work algorithm would consume 90%, around 90% less, uh, energy, uh, would have a, a 90% less energy consumption, uh, which is a significant, which is an improvement that is significant, I think. Is it enough? You know, people have different opinions on this, but it is already a step in a good direction. Uh, yeah. 
I don't know. I don't know if my explanation of proof of less work was super clear, but it's basically a, a lot of people wonder about, uh, yeah, but if then the, the, you know, the cost, people have the misconception that the cost of mining the new block stop to increase if we don't increase the, the cost of computing power, but the cost of binding a new block constantly increases, just not paid exclusively in computing power. It's paid in a combination of both. Um, so there's no loss of security by internalizing part of that cost for the chain. And to be clear, um, the burning of the coins at that cap would be done at the protocol layer. Like you're, there's no uh, voluntary decision by the miners to do that. It's just integrated from day one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's for everyone. Uh, and it is for everyone. Uh, obviously, the threshold is one exahash right now. Um, so we're getting closer, but still far from it. Uh, getting the hash rate has, has increased, I think, the past few weeks quite quite a lot, but uh, we're still far from it. And this is dynamic, right? So meaning that if, if the hash rate goes below the threshold, then we go back into being full classic proof of work. Uh, so this is dynamic. And yeah. And I would assume that also factored into this idea of having 1 billion ALF, right, as a hard cap because as uh, more demand hopefully grows for Elephium and you reach that cap, um, there's gonna be more ALF of the total supply burned. Is that correct? Like taken out of circulation at that point? Uh, yes, well, I mean, just to be clear, the, the, the maximum supply of 1 billion will be reached when all of us here will be dead, unless there are some crazy medical advances that happen uh, for, for the entire maximum supply of lithium to be mined. Uh, this is around 80 years from now. Um, but yeah, there are a lot of deflationary forces into LFM to tokenomics. One is that uh, right now, 50% of the transaction fee are burned with every transaction. And actually, uh, after the Lemon upgrade, so after March 30th, it will be 100% of the transaction fee that are burned. Um, and obviously, once proof of, uh, proof of less work is, reaches its triggers, there are additional uh, ALF being burned with every block being mined. So those are deflationary forces uh, that that in, in the tokenomics of LFM. Uh, okay. There's also, yeah. uh, for example, when you um, develop smart contracts and you deploy smart contracts, we require like one ALF to be deposited into the contracts. That's not like burn, token burns, but uh, if you if you imagine like a lot of smart contracts being deployed, <laughs> Then it, yeah, it uh, basically gets locked. So that's a deflationary force as well. Yeah. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah, that that is very cool. No, you guys did a great job of uh, kind of freestyling um, about those unique value propositions. I think it was well understood. I understood everything you guys said. Um, so yeah, thank you for demystifying those um, terms. You know. A lot of people see that um, and they don't understand it perhaps um, at face value. They have to really get into the documentation, read very technical things, and then maybe they're more confused at the end than when they start <laughs> if they're not familiar with all the intricacies of it. Um, so finally, uh, to kind of wrap up the interview, um, I wanted to get your take on the future of Alephium. You know, once you get past the Le Mans upgrade and you reach that milestone, what is the future going to be like? Because you guys, I mean, you haven't been around all that long and you guys, you, you've accomplished so much in, in such little time. Well, I, I think first, I, I do want to say, I think everyone uh, in the in the core contributor of Alephium, but also in the community has done uh, a lot for the past, uh, well, year and almost a half, but not yet that the network was launched. I think we... We uh, were incredibly efficient uh, and, you know, hold on to and really delivered what we committed to. Um, I think what I would want to see for the next couple of years of Alephium after the Lemo upgrade and the bridge being released is really to see the ecosystem flourish. 
and have, you know, like, you know, it's like spring, a few little flowers here and there, and then whew, suddenly full bloom. So this is what I am uh, happy to see. I, I am really excited to see more developers getting uh, enthusiastic about what uh, Hong Xiao and the rest of the team uh, has built. Um, and yeah, and I, and I hope to see also more, um, to go back into this, to see more collaboration and, and more uh, connection around different ecosystem uh, as well. Yes, that would be what I would want to see and what I'm excited about. Um, I think there are lots, also a lot of improvements that we can continue to make uh, to at the blockchain level and uh, so on, for example, like storage, um, there's like automation for that. We want to have like light lines. Um, we want to improve uh, like basically across so many things that we can we can do to do that. But on the uh, application layer, I would uh, like to see, yeah, like, for example, social network, it could be a very interesting thing. Uh, decentralized social network could be a very interesting thing. Uh, like just something that can actually bring uh, real users to the ecosystem. Uh, that would yeah. be pretty awesome, yeah. Yeah. And uh, there was another thing I wanted to say, it crossed my mind and then it is gone. Oh yes, now it's back. What, what I'm also excited to see is also to see more uh, people becoming core contributor to Alephium because right now, obviously being very early stage, we have kind of the core contributor and the first builders of Alephium. And I'm excited to see this number grow as more, commun more community members start contributing, obviously by building on top of Alephium, but also maybe start contributing to uh, to Alephium itself. Uh, so that's also something I'm excited to see. Wonderful. Um, I dare ask, um, there's always this kind of uh, catch-22 when it comes to pioneering a, a blockchain and you have the core development team. Um, for a decentralized network, uh, do you guys ever think about like, I'm just asking curiously, on, on the timeline of your involvement into the project, do you envision it being a lifelong endeavor? I mean, the blockchain will outlive you. That's kind of a not a scary thought, but kind of a, a humbling thought to think about. Is it that the core team eventually slowly but surely hands over the keys of development to the community once there's enough of a budding ecosystem and developers take real interest into the ecosystem? Or how do you guys envision, or, or there is no timeline as of now, since you're so early on? Well, I mean, we can have a wish timeline and then just we don't have control over this. But I think that uh, for Cheng, that is not here, who was really like, let's say, the first, right? Uh, since a lot of the, since he came up with a lot of the innovation that then uh, the core contributor implemented, I think there's always what we want is to, the, the one behind Alephium is to build something useful. And there's no, there is a want that eventually what is today the core contributor kind of ends up merging with the community. And then it's, it's that we phase out into the LFM ecosystem and is this. So it would be more like this. It wouldn't be that we hand over the key in a sense, but more like we get assimilated into the broader, what will become the broader LFM movement. And obviously, as any early project, I'm sure there are some core contributors that were here in the beginning that might not be here in a couple of years or things like this. But overall, the idea is that uh, we get assimilated into the broader uh, ecosystem that will be built on to Alephium, if that makes sense. Uh, yeah, I, I, I haven't thought about this, but um, I feel that we, we are, we're trying to build a, like a useful useful uh, protocol and we, we want useful things to be built on top of uh, Alephim uh, blockchain and personally I believe that if something is useful then people will continue to build, build on it uh, so and we'll maintain it as we'll well maintain it exactly so that probably that's uh, what's uh, what's important I guess yeah yeah I, I think we also I don't know if we touched on this in the previous interview that we made like uh, when we did the the pre-sale of Alephium we we consciously also chose not to 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 sell for a considerable amount if you compare to to the 
the the scale at which uh, the scale of money that goes into certain protocols and thing there was there was a, a choice to be a little bit more conservative because like Hong Xiao said what we want is to build something useful that people can leverage to build useful stuff on on top we have no interest into artificially maintaining something that nobody use and nobody find an interest in so if we did a good job at building something useful like like Hong Xiao said then you know people using Alephium have an, an incentive into also contributing to 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 the protocol level and continuing to improve it um yeah as well so this so that's what we want to achieve perfect perfect um yeah i think those are all good answers um and um i guess one final thought that i would mention going back to what we were discussing uh, proof of work mining you know there there seems to be um controversy from regulators no matter which type of consensus model you pick if you do proof of stake they want to make it a security if you do proof of work you're destroying the planet um and i guess um uh, oftentimes with crypto because we're so early on into the development cycle of this innovation and technology overall um it feels like the the idea of value is not really being brought to the forefront you know there's many things that use incredible incredible amounts of electricity for no particularly good reason that i can think of off the top of my head like christmas lights you know um just in the us alone and um i think it's important that versus just artificial as you mentioned artificially pegging value to something that maybe nobody uses um it's important that we look at what is the value that can come from the actual innovation itself and then give that a uh, monetary price and um and if you do that properly then you have a resilient proof of work network um like bitcoin uh that went from being worth nothing from a fi uh financial point of view to whatever the pretty much society globally has determined would be a good equivalent value for that um in dollar mm -hmm. figures right um so i think that's more important and i'm it's unfortunate that conversation is not being had um yeah i i think that whenever you you look at the ecological impact of something first of all it's really difficult to consider it uh you know holistically because when you look you look at when you look at the energy consumption of a network you can look at how much does it cost to mine a new block but there's also the cost or how what is the cost to access the information so you know, you cannot just look at the cost of mining a new block because that's not the only thing that happened into an ecosystem. And I think that where you are right is I, I think today, uh, especially proof of work has a lot of bad rep because people have been focusing on one aspect to the network, but not looking into um, all of the other aspects of the network that might maybe not justify, but at least come into as factor when evaluating the overall ecological impact. And, you know, people have different opinion, but some people might think that having a censorship resistant, decentralized and secure network is worth uh, some uh, energy consumption or not. And yeah, I think this is a big debate and there are a lot of opinion. I think that all we can do is uh, do the best, the best that we can and educate people, offer perspective and different things. Uh, like again, if I was, uh, when I was talking about, people look a lot at the cost of mining, but in a lot of proof of stake ecosystem, if you want to run a node and therefore have, you know, access to blockchain data without relying on an intermediary, um, the infrastructure that you have to run in order to be able to access blockchain information directly is out of reach for the majority of people. And if as many people, uh, you know, if you take all of the people that are running uh, a proof of work based node to access blockchain data, I'm not talking about mining, just to access blockchain data, did the same thing on a proof of stake system, uh, you know, the infrastructure, first of all, they probably wouldn't be able to because the, they wouldn't, the infrastructure needed for it would be out of reach, but also probably then the energy consumption uh, would be a lot different. So, it, you know, it's always difficult to to set comparison um, between things. Yeah, definitely. I I tried doing a presentation. I think it's live now from the 
uh, today, March 18th, and this interview will be up March uh, 25th, trying to put both of them in perspective. And it's really about trade-offs and what are you trying to accomplish? But yeah, you're right. It, it's um, it's difficult to, to set, you know, there's trade-offs for everything. Let's put it exactly. that way. And we have to look at things as a whole. And, you know, it, it, in defense of proof of work and Alethium, for example, being a, a really new blockchain and a lot of innovation in it, um, although going proof of work is kind of going against the grain of where the industry has been trending towards with proof of stake and account-based models, um, doing the UTXO, doing proof of work um, allows you to also have um, – accessibility to your native asset without having to interact with an exchange um, from from the genesis um, of a wallet cr being created. So you don't yeah. have to go through any gatekeepers um, or interact with any other um, um, exchanges in order to yeah. acquire ALF. Anybody can acquire ALF as long as they create the wallet and they begin mining. Um, yeah. And apart from that, obviously, it's harder to get a consensus of miners around a protocol if it's bad in design, because um, if you have, um, let's say, 100 blockchains, it's hard to get miners to say, you know, we're going to all mine 100 blockchains. They typically, like a Pareto distribution, they kind of centralize and gravitate towards um, the top ones in a proof of work setting. And by default, um, it also helps to um, legitimize and validate that uh, cryptocurrency and that blockchain as being um, superior in, in, technolo in technology and worth because uh, you have an aggregation of miners mining just that um, versus speculatively uh, being rewarded tokens for staking them, in, in, for example. But it, it's amazing what you've accomplished too because uh, proof of stake is also... Um, tends to have better scaling solutions involved in it because it's more efficient from an energy point of view. It's harder to do 51% uh, attacks, but you guys also have kind of mitigated that um, kind of chink in proof of works armor by having all of this innovation with block flow and proof of less work um, to be able to have scaling from day one, you know, right out of the box, you have yeah. all of these things that can help you scale with on a layer one. Um, yeah. So I think that, you know, this is, it's, it's hard to overstate how important that is, uh, and how difficult that is as well, and, and the type of talented uh, developers that you need to be able to implement that right off out of the gate. So, um, yeah, and maybe yeah. to add to what you're saying is like, it's actually those technical technological choice that are a little bit like you said um, on the on the other side of where the industry is going. It's because we've made the the technological choice different technological choice that this is what allow us to also build uh on top of that a lot of different innovation that are not possible uh on on the side and to propose new things new paradigm a, a very different developer experience and so even though those are not let's say the the mainstream in the industry technological choices making that decision allowed us to build uh, new things and bring new innovation and and bring something new, I think, to the space. So I I, I think uh, we're we're happy with those choice so far. And maybe just to say also the way the way uh, Chang and the rest of the core dev everything is built also with resiliency in mind, meaning that um, we're block flow is consensus algorithm agnostic, so that. Uh, so that you know, if if a better solution comes into the future, Alephium can evolve more easily because the way things have been built, they are being they have been built in a way that can evolve. So we we know that what is what we consider uh, the best solution for us right now. In ten years from now, five years from now, there might be something new that comes up and that make you know that will require Alephium to evolve and and things have been built in a way that Alephium can be resilient to change and can benefit for from changes in the future as well. And I think that was something that was really important uh, for us. Right. Well. Uh, and, and to cap off uh, one of you, I forgot which one of you, but you mentioned that you believe the future is multi-chain. I'm, I'm betting it was Hong Chao. Um, yes. And yes. What, what, I, what I would urge um, the people watching, since I kind of have like a bit of a, more of an ergo concentration in terms of uh, viewership and following, is that um, people on Alephium are 
easily approachable as well on their Discord and social media. Um, maybe one of the benefits of being early on involved in that community is that you're able to have more of a direct relationship and see uh, kind of the same community members pop up over and over again. Um, so you're able to kind of, I suppose, find your place easier than if you were on a Discord for um, Polygon or something like that. So just um, don't be closed-minded. Be open to um, other innovations out there. It's something I would really want uh, Ergo community and other chains to really focus in on. Don't become a maximalist and religious about one particular chain and then disregard everything else, all the innovation that comes after 2009 and, and some of the forks, you know? Um, just please, uh, just try to check them out. Um, you can find a lot of resources on their website. Um, and, you know, look into the documentation. Maybe you'll learn something, you know. It's really it's really interesting what they're building. You're probably going to have some ELF uh, eventually as the bridges get launched with Rosenbridge and things like that. So might as well start now. Got it. <laughs> All right. So thank you both, uh, Mode and Hong Chao, uh, for taking the time to do this interview. It was really fun researching for it. And um, I think uh, Alephium has a bright future, especially um, when we're looking at um, new technologies that have unique value proposition in the crypto industry. So thank you both. Oh, thank you for having us. It's always a pleasure. So, you know, if you want to have us again in the future, we'll, uh, <laughs> we'll, be, we'll be here again. Thanks. Uh, enjoy the conversation. Thank you. <laughs> That's the best compliment I could get from a, a core yeah. developer. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you for watching. Oh, oh and Thanks. I'll also put some of the resource links in the description if you're interested in just clicking on those about Alephia. All right. See you in the next one.